Well, Brooks Lee Perry, yeah. welcome to the Brook Hill Podcast. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Let me give a little bio here. Uh, this is Brooks Lee Perry. This is my wife's cousin, mm-hmm. um, Hetty, founder of Brook Hill, grandson. Yep. Would you, you would be the oldest. Oldest grandson. Yeah. Old, that's, Whoa. that's the top. Yeah, I guess. Um, Brooks Lee, legacy counselor, from the walkers now the, the what made you so amazing as a counselor was you were in my bunkhouse uh-huh, as a graduate uh-huh. then at jc in my bunkhouse where i had two weeks to really show Underneath you the ropes. Some great leadership oh right man there. don't do that that was stupid brooks <laughs> don't do that oh my gosh that was terrible you know a lot of those talks that i had with oh, you yeah. oh yeah <laughs> um, so Brooks Hill, uh, uh, so so Brooks Lee was the goat. You were the goat in the Walkers for four summers. But but mm-hmm. you basically were kind of born and raised here at Brook Hill. Yeah. That's kind of your bio. Yeah, yeah. I was born out uh, here in Hot Springs. Lived on the ranch for a couple of years. Um, my dad was a uh, camp director for right. nearly a decade. Yes. And so I was running around in diapers out here all over the place. And so yeah, I grew up. And then we moved off. Um, and then I would come back every summer and, you know, jump in and help out and, um, you know, the rest is history. Like it was, it was a great time being come part on. of the, part of the family, but I loved coming out here. I love this that. was home. Okay. Now, before we jump into this, I want to get into family and, you know, like your family, Lindsay, everybody, before we do that, are you up for playing a game? Oh yeah, because Brooks is fun. He, he you know, you're you're fun. Heck you know, yeah. you, your kids may not think you're fun anymore, <laughs> but um, Bro- <laughs> Brooks has been really fun. All right, so we're gonna play uh, a game here. Mr. Cole, uh, in just a second, is gonna throw up a timer. You got thirty seconds. Oh boy! All right, can we see the leaderboard, Cole? Can we throw that up? Oh, oh, Tyler's got the leaderboard right here. The pressure's on. All right, so the leaderboard officially, we got Callan at twenty-seven, Stewart at twenty-four. Ben Brown at 23. Now, to update this, I do believe Molly is in second place. Molly is in second place with, like, 25. Dang. So, here's the way this works. This is a Brook Hill podcast, so we're going to play Brook Hill games. It's going to be about Brook Hill. Okay. you got 30 seconds. Okay. So, it's pretty tough. 27, that means one a second. Okay, I know you're not real good at math, but I'm just <laughs> we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, uh, so, you got three categories. Brook Hill songs, Brook Hill activities, and it doesn't have to be current. Uh, and then Brookhill Cabins, to name as many as you can in 30 seconds. The timer, he's getting his headspace ready. <laughs> the timer is going to go up there on the screen to make him freak out. You ready? Go. Uh, Walkers, Mustangs, Morgans, Apples, Broncos, uh, Mavericks, Hackneys, Buckskins. I don't know if I missed any. Uh, riflery, uh, Water Rides, Go-Karts. Archery, horseback, big lake, small lake, bumper boats, fun swim, boy sports, girl sports, hodgepodge, cheerleading, gymnastics, tennis. Um, oh, unofficially? 23. 23. Oh. That's actually really good Dang. right there. Okay. All right. It's got to be in, that's in the top five category right there. That's impressive. Let's go. Nice. Not too bad. All right. You should have let Lindsay do the first podcast. <laughs> She'll kill me on the you, next oh yeah. one. Oh, she's going to be studying. <laughs> she's going to be over there going. <laughs> yeah, she got an advantage. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> All right. So uh, now you are married. You have a whole bunkhouse full of kids. Yeah. Um, and you guys are now in the Houston area. So, so uh, Lindsay and I met at camp. Okay. Um, she uh, is from Lake Charles, had grown up coming to camp uh, her whole life from the third grade. Um, the Lake Charles crew, we call them the Lake Charles crew, they would come in for the two-week session. Yes. And they brought two bus loads full from Lake two Charles. Char- that was the charter yeah, bus. Charter era. buses that would come in. And uh, actually, before I even had known her, I was uh, friends with her brothers. Okay. Um, her, her older brother, Kyle, uh, were, he and I were in the same cabin. He was an older camper, looked up to him. He was just the coolest guy ever. Um, and it wasn't until 
uh, Lindsay and I were JCs together, and then she came back full summer, full time um, as a senior counselor. And the first summer really kind of got to know each other. Second summer, it was like, oh, oh hey, okay, hey, how you doing? And Let's then one summer camp was over, like no dating during summer. Um, and then summer was over, and so we did long distance. She was in Louisiana. I was still up in Colorado um, where we had moved to. I'd grown up out in Colorado. So we did the long distance thing and then got married when we got done with school. And Houston was kind of been our home base. Um, we've got three kids, Gavin, Miles, and Brooklyn. Um, Gavin is going to be a freshman this year, 13. Come on. And then Miles is going to be 11, 6th grade, and Brooklyn's 10, 5th grade. And so we've kind of moved all over with my work. Um, we were in Houston. We so what do you do? So I'm an engineer. Okay. Uh, I work for a chemical company. Um, we moved to the Middle East. Um, actually That's lived crazy. in Saudi Arabia for a couple of years. Uh, Miles and Brooklyn were born over there. Wow. Um, we moved back to Amarillo, um, the Panhandle area, then back to Houston. And now just in the last year, we've been back up to Amarillo. So kind of all over every couple of years we've moved around. But um, wherever we've gone, we've just kind of made the best of life wherever we're at. Come on. And so now you are like, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm going to get the terminology right, like VP <laughs> of the plant, vice president, vice whatever. So I, I'm the operations manager for our facility. So, I, okay. you know, all operations that go on day to day, I'm, I'm responsible for. How many guys and girls you got working for you now? So I've got... Uh, Gosh, I've got almost 100 for me Come directly, on. and then um, we've got about 250 in our plant. So, wow. Yeah. Come on. That was and pretty cool. That That is really cool. Yeah. Do you th do you attribute some of the things that you learned here uh, in, you know, just some of your leadership that, that you're doing now? You know, one of the coolest things, we had Teresa Ferguson, which I want to have her on the uh -huh. podcast, but she came and spoke to our staff this yeah. summer. And it was kind of a spur-of-the-moment deal, but Teresa said um, – she said, I, I would have never been ready for what I'm doing now if it wasn't for being faithful in the little when I was here. Mm -hmm. And she said, the same things that I learned and cut my teeth on here, God is using me oh, yeah. to do Absolutely. that. Um, and so, you know, what, what would be like some leadership stuff that you feel like you use now? You know, so a, a day doesn't go by. You don't have to talk about all the stuff you learned in the Mustangs. <laughs> Just you can just say anonymously you learned it wherever. <laughs> so a day doesn't go by that there isn't something that I learned here at camp that I'm applying at work with with my people, whether it's at a local level or at a corporate strategic level. Um, like in what ways? Can you unpack so, that a little bit? So Can you here's the first story that I would tell about, about me. Let's throw the um, stories out there. So like it. I'm an engineer, definitely on the nerdy side, Okay. Um, definitely the um, quiet introvert. And as I grew up, as I came in and being out here in the summer, I would help out all over the place. Um, my comfort zone was the co-cut okay. um, back in the day before it burned down. <laughs> um, I would I would go and work and I loved working. I loved working hard. You know, pop taught me how to work hard. My mom taught me how to work hard. And um, so I was always um, having a servant attitude, um, but it was always behind the scenes. It was always quiet. It was always, um, you know couldn't really introduce myself to anybody had a hard time just speaking up or saying anything um, and I was probably in about the fifth or sixth grade and Stephen Sexton <laughs> was my counselor at the time and he pulled me out of the co-cut and said he looked at me and he said you've got a whole lot more potential in you than to hide in the co-cut wow. and he said I don't want to ever see you in the co-cut again and it was like, for me, it was just like devastating. Like my world's crumbling around me, getting pulled out of my comfort zone. And he said, every day, I want you to go and meet 50 people. And, I, and I'm thinking, I, like, maybe one or two is like good for me. But he said 50. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. So the first day, I'm like, I'm starting to like slowly go up to people, introduce myself. And um, the first day, I could probably got like 27 people. And I went back and he asked me, what, how many people did you meet? Well, I, I met 27. He's like, no, that's not good enough. You got to meet 50. So the next day, like I'm up in my game, like trying to go out and meet people, just feeling completely intimidated. But like 
having to take that initiative and step out of myself, out of my comfort zone, doing something that I didn't necessarily want to do, but it was building something inside of me. And second day got a little bit easier. Third day got a little bit easier. And it, it was still awkward. I would go up and meet people and they're like, yeah, we already met you. And it was like, uh, okay, well, it's good to meet you still. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but it was that continual stepping out, meeting people. And that was really one of the early things from a leadership standpoint that um, taught me, trained me so much um, to step out of my comfort zone and doing new and different things. And as you can see, I've been all over the world. I've been at different facilities. I've worked with, you know, hundreds of thousands of people all over. And I, you know, I use that same skill today of just meeting somebody and connecting with somebody and having that conversation. And, you know, I obviously use it as I became a counselor, senior counselor and, and connecting with kids and making that first connection, making that first um, uh, impression and um, that goes a long way, um, mm -hmm. and that's what it. That's what leadership is all about: is connecting with people. That's uh, it. And so uh, that was that would be one of the the big things right. that you know was life changing right. for me through camp. Well, I love the statement this that is if it doesn't challenge you, mm -hmm. it doesn't change you, and you know. So obviously, Steve challenged you, which that, that's just who Steve was. That's who Steve was. But yeah. let me ask you this: How mad? In the moment, were you at, were, were like on internally, do you remember being oh, like, yeah. I hate this guy? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, seriously. Absolutely. Yeah, it was a, it was a beyond just frustration, um, but for Almost sure. Almost provoking uh, you yeah, to Yeah, for sure. To and, and it was that turmoil inside of. That's right. Well, do I really want to do this? Right. Like, do I really have to, and what is he going to, you know, what is he going to do if I don't? And, That's right. But it was it was something that I had enough respect for Steve mm -hmm. to say, I don't want to disappoint him. Mm -hmm. I don't want to let him down. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to jump out and do this, even though I don't want to. Well, I just think there's two vantage points here. Number one, there is you being this young person having a high level leader challenge you mm -hmm. and how important it is for us to not let our pride or our comfort zone or whatever block the growth yeah because you were willing and, and, and obviously Brooks that that is a major part of sure. why you are you who you are yeah. you are so teachable even mm -hmm. even if it literally is massively outside of your comfort zone <laughs> and that's why you know high level leaders are very teachable absolutely and that's what makes you a high level leader yeah is how teachable you are as a person. But I think there's there's two vantage points. There's number one, people learning to get around people who will push us out of our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, as leaders, it's important that we push people. Oh, yeah. I mean, for you yeah. as a leader, I'm sure that even taught you not only to get outside of your zone, but okay, I need to push people mm -hmm. because I would imagine you're a little more like me in the way that we don't, we don't rock the boat as much as Steve-O does. <laughs> you know, that's very natural for him. <laughs> and so I tell people sometimes I may miss the potential because of it as yeah. a leader. Yeah. It, yeah. And so you've got to be able to have that assessment of people. And that was what Mim was amazing at. Steven mm -hmm. was great at it. Mm -hmm. And he learned a lot of that from Mim. Uh, but Mim was so good at, seeing the potential in people, mm -hmm. seeing that even though you act at this level, there's so much more for you than mm -hmm. where you're at right now. And so we've got to, you know, every day I'm, I'm trying to find those opportunities to say, yes, this is where you're at right now, but, but where do we got to get you for five years from now? Mm -hmm. It's not about this job and it's not even about the next job, but it's about the job after that. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're starting to develop you for and finding ways to give you more, um, put more on your plate, more than what you thought you were capable of, capable of doing. And that's where you find where people grow is in that stretch. Just like um, when you when you run, you know, you have that, you know, the first month. Yep. of trying to get back in shape just is so painful. You go and lift weights and you get so sore. It's that through that pain is that growth. Um, and you've got to, you got to keep pushing through that and keep finding. And you'll get to a plateau of, man, I, you know, I've been in this role three years or five years or 10 mm. years and realize, um, man, I've just been coasting. I got to find something 
you know, what's, what's the next thing out there for me personally, but also for my people too. That's so good. You know, you were a legacy counselor. It's something we major on now four Mm -hmm. years, right? Four years in the walkers. Yep. Um, and I know that fourth year was a tough one for you because you were really being pressured to go to these internships. And I love you and I've talked about this before Mm -hmm. and I love your perspective on this because engineer, engineer, obviously very highly intelligent people, like you said, tend to be more introverts, tend to maybe not be big communicators. And one of the things that you attest working summer camp is the communication skills that you learned, whether it be with your peers, whether it be with the campers, learn how to communicate with all kinds of personalities. And, you know, I've heard you talk about maybe how that kind of set you apart, that this was maybe a better internship for your leadership as an engineer. Sure. You know, maybe talk a little bit to that and some of those stories. I've been involved in recruiting ever since I hired on. I've been with this company 16 years now, and I've been involved off and on with recruiting pretty much the whole time. And um, we th- we learn things as we go along, uh, but you get some people that are very set on, well, somebody has to have an industry-related internship, um, you know, and the more that they have, you know, the better their credentials are for coming into a job. And I, you know, that, that real, I struggled with that whenever they were setting some of those precedences for hiring, because um, I said, well, if that was the case, then I, I would have never gotten hired on. Um, and people kind of give me a funny look at that and they were like, no, no, you're, you know, you're, you're a great leader. (laughs) How would we have not have hired you? It's like, well, I I never had an industry related internship before I went into industry. And so I challenge our teams, our, our recruiting teams to say, you know, we, we've got to think outside the box and not just hone in on, well, you have to have. Um, these industry things because you know from from my perspective as as I'm hiring somebody in um, engineers accountants whatever it is technical field that you go through schooling and learn you've learned all that in school Um, and the little bit of internships that you're going to get in the industry is going to be good you're going to get a little you're going to dabble your toe in and learn a little bit of the nuances and a little bit of the terminology or codes and standards that we use uh, but in the grand scheme of things, we're really looking for people with initiative, drive, humility, like we were talking about earlier, is coachable and teachable, and really somebody that has the soft skills, the leadership skills. And you don't necessarily always get that in an in a industry-related internship. Um, and so whenever I was going through my uh, application interview process, you know, I, I talked a lot about my time here at camp and working with um, other ca- a team of counselors, working with you know hundreds of kids, um, and being able to um, a look out for the safety of their kids because right. now now I'm on the other side of it. And my <laughs> wife and I laugh about it all the time, you know, dropping off your kids to a college kid student to look out for for a week or two weeks. Like, it's true. It's, it's crazy. True. But we didn't think about that we then. We didn't think about that then. But but you really were. I, I'm responsible for these 12 or 22 right. kids for a week or two weeks um, and making sure, you know, we're looking out for their well-being. And it's 24-7. It's not like, oh, they show up here in the morning and get, you know, get picked up in the afternoon. It's through the night, you know. And so there's always stuff. There's, you know, some of the activities that we're doing. You have to pay attention to the safety um, aspect of it. But then um, up getting up in front and speaking in, in front of a, a crowd of 300, 400 people, you know, that's something that isn't necessarily right. taught in schools or in internships. You don't get that exposure. And we're doing it week over week, day after day, multiple times a day. Um, going back to who I am, um, this was something else I was going to tell about was um, being an introvert, being quiet, um, my other opportunity of growth as I was coming to camp, uh, Mim um, told stories and <laughs> she would get up and talk and all that. Um, and I, I don't know if a day went by when she wasn't pulling me up to say something. And so everybody knew me because I was <laughs> Hetty's grandson. And, you know, my, my wife's nodding over there because she remembers me from getting up and talking and like, again, fear, like, because because public speaking is a big fear for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, it's, I t- it's like a top. It's it's like, yeah, 
It's like a top fear for people. For sure. And if you're going to be a leader, you got to be able you've, to speak. You've got to be able to do it. And it, and I tell everybody, it takes practice. And there's no better place um, to build that than than really at camp. Because again, we're getting up and doing skits and doing devotionals and doing songs or goofy skits or whatever it is. We're getting we're getting up uh, in front of them and. And having to do that. And so she forced me to do that at a very young age. Gosh, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, those years. And again, I hated doing it. I hated because I'd get up and, I, well, I don't have anything to talk about. And then as I got a little bit older, a little bit wiser, then I was, I knew she was going to pull me up. So I'm thinking about, okay, <laughs> what am I going to talk about? Because she's going to tell me something. So I get up there and ramble about something. And I sit down. And I didn't know half the time if I'd said anything right. worth saying, but it wasn't about that. No you were developing it was developing my ability to get up and overcome that fear be able to put together some thoughts um to be able to share from my heart you know to the group and so now again um i can get up and kill a presentation anytime i can get up in front of the whole plant and give a safety presentation or safety top whatever it is mm -hmm. and people are like well did you have to prep and i was like nah. like, but i think it's important to recognize you're an introvert naturally. Yeah. You know, and I think it's important to understand that just because naturally we tend in some way, we can learn skills, mm -hmm. you know, in, in soft skills. I, I like that you use that term yeah. because it's something we've really been majoring on here because I feel like it's all we do is mm -hmm. soft skills, mm -hmm. right? Yep. All we do is talk about communication and grit yeah. and yeah. work ethic and leadership and blah, blah, blah. Right. You know what I mean? It's like 10 really major soft skills. And uh, there was an article put out by a major news. I think it was Fox or somebody. And they just talked about how 90% of people are lacking in soft skills. Oh, yeah. And yet we're all going to expensive schools, private or public. It's still expensive. Mm -hmm. And we're not, te you know, soft skills are, 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 you know this from leadership. They're the most highly sought after thing today because people don't have them. Yeah. You yeah, know? Absolutely. And so you're liter you've made yourself a valuable commodity, but I love that you said you're an introvert because I think everybody thinks it's the extrovert, it's the loud person, it's right. whatever. That's who the leaders are. Right. No, anybody can be anybody a leader. Be. Yep. You just got to get out of your comfort zone, yep. no matter what that comfort zone is, right? Right, right. absolutely. Yeah, I, and everybody can develop into that. And um, there's a lot of different things, you know, personality, um, um uh, traits, personality tests, and things like that that you can take. But there's also, um, we talk about them as competencies. Competencies are behaviors or skills um, that you use day in and day out. And, you know, there's a number of good resources that are out there. Um, one that I really like is um, for your improvement. And it's just a whole list of competencies that... Okay. Uh, what, what is that for your improvement? Like explain that. What is so, that? So for your improvement, it's just a, it's a giant book of, uh, you know, hundreds of different competencies, um, anywhere from communication to decision making to, um, humor to relationship with bosses, relationship to with peers, relationship with, um, you know, your, your employees, um, um, and you read this and go through it and yeah, study it and, and try so, and work on well, some of this it's, stuff? It's not necessarily a read that you read from back to front. Sure. It, it's okay. a reference. Kinda. It's a reference guide yeah. that you can go in there and pull out different things. And it, it teaches you um, what is what is the um, you're not using this competency well or what is this? Hey, you are using this competency Good. well or what are you? overusing this competency and i i really like that to be able to have those direct conversations as i'm developing people to say here here's the piece that you really need to focus in on good and it isn't necessarily to turn people or make people into what they're not um but it, it's really to hone in on the specific competencies and like you said a lot of those we're we're using and learning here mm. um at at camp and and so um, but you're literally, you, you study that for yourself. You study that for your yeah, team. Yeah. I love that Brooks, because, you know, people think that, that you just end up somewhere. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, they're just gifted mm -hmm. at that. And, and what I've learned, whether you study the Kobe Bryant's of the world or whatever, they just outwork everybody. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so, okay, you want to be a high level leader? 
okay, well, you, you need to you need to go look in the mirror and ask yourself, am I these things? Yeah. Okay, I'm not. I need to work on it. Right. Yeah, I, I don't care what it is people want to be good at. Yeah. They don't realize. It's not just, okay, you were promoted. Now you're the boss. You get to tell everybody what to do. Yep. Okay. <laughs> that's, yep. Not, no. that's not the no. way it works. No, not, not, absolutely not. And there, there are cases <coughs> when that happens, and everybody knows and, and recognizes that those people are in a place – of management, not necessarily leadership. Um, they're there with the title, but not necessarily somebody that people are following. Positional leaders versus actual right. leaders. Right, right. And so that's key. And that goes back to that, you know, connecting and developing people and working with people. And, and people know the difference. People can tell. People can Come tell on. when you care um, truly about them. And I, I think that's something that um, you you find here at camp. That's something that I found here at camp is just having a heart for people, a heart for loving on people because of the gospel, because of the good news that we have to share um, with them um, and carrying that into um, wherever you go. You know, Jesus talked about the Great Commission as you as you go. Right. You know, preach the word, you yep. know, tell people about the gospel, the good news. And that isn't just that church right and that isn't just at um well, this seminar or whatever but that's um as you go um in my day when i'm getting a cup of coffee in the kitchen or as i'm walking into a meeting i'm connecting i'm, I'm caring about people and because people people make the business right you, you, the yes we've got a lot of sophisticated machines a lot of automated controls but at the end of the day it's about people well one one of my memories of you as a red t-shirt was you would you would sit by the door of the meal line uh-huh and you would just meet kids yeah what's funny is i wonder if that had to do a little bit with what steve had taught you at a young age mm-hmm. right yep. um and you know i knew you so i knew it wasn't about you like look at me you you genuinely yeah. wanted to get to know all those campers yeah. and by standing in that line meeting all those kids like, I, like most meals i feel like you did it maybe maybe you had a strategy about it but it just you knew the camp mm-hmm. and you were learning to meet yeah. and connect yeah. I and mean, that was a big part of who you were yeah, yeah right absolutely and it and i i realized um, early on, I thought it was it was the grand moments that made a difference in the campers' lives. And um, as I as I had grown and matured in in as a counselor, I realized that it wasn't about the giant moments. It was the small little moments that made all the difference in the world in in a kid's life. Um, like what would be an example? What well, would be well, like- whether it's meeting them and and knowing their name. Um, or, or remembering something that they brought up or talked about and being able to come back to that at a different time, a different conversation. And, you know, they, they feel that, that special, that connection through that. And, um, but it, it could be as, as small as, uh, teaming up and playing foosball. Come on. It, it could be as simple as, um, sitting on the bench and having a conversation or sharing, you know, um, some candy or or whatever. I, and, and it doesn't have to be these grandiose moments. And now as a parent, I find that with my own kids. Um, it's the little stuff of, you know, connecting right before bedtime, of just coming in. And yes, I've been working, you know, long hours and we haven't had a ton of time to just spend hours together. But you know, the, the 10 or 15 minutes of intentional time can make a huge difference. Now, obviously, you've got to balance that and you've got to have the work-life balance. Uh, but being there for the game or being there for important moments in their life um, can be can be really important for them as well. I'm glad you brought that up, the work-life balance. And mm-hmm. I think that for high, especially high-level leaders, that I think it's the toughest thing in the world, but it's the most important thing. Yeah, you know, I'm sure you've battled with that. I'm oh, sure yeah. that's been that's something that that <laughs> that you and Lindsay have worked on yeah. a few yeah. fun conversations that were just delightful to have. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but but it's so key, and man, that's the thing. You know, I love books like Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. I don't know if you've read mm-hmm. that one. I love. Um, uh, things like boundaries or, um, you know, learning when, when to transition, you yeah. know, I, I, I love all those kinds of things, um, because as leaders, we have to learn to trim back the things in our lives mm-hmm. 
that are just busy. Yeah. And how have you navigated that as a high level leader? You know, um, I, I'm just, and, and maybe that's something we're like uh, on the drive up here, y'all. <laughs> you're to fight about. I don't know, but you know, but uh, but you know, that I, I know my life changed about five years ago when I learned to have way more balance. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just yeah. it was life changing. What yeah. so. You know, I, we talk about seasons, um, and and there are seasons when it's time to take the harvest. It, you know, sure. you think about har- f- farmers it, being out in the panhandle right now, big farm country, um, and for them, there are certain seasons where Good. it's time to get it. Mm. It's time that we got to put in the long hours to make it happen, to get done what we need to get done. Um, and then there's, then there's next step is next seasons into, okay, let's rest, you know, and let the, let the land rest. Um, and it's the same thing with us and by no means am I perfect about it, but it has been something that over the years is trying to find what that healthy balance is. Um, and there are seasons when at work it's time to get it. And then there's times when, okay, it's, it's time to rest and it's time to step away and, and going back to the idea of, of being there for those moments with our, with our kids, with our family, with my wife, um, you've got to have it because you can't burn it at both ends. And, um, you, you've, you've got to realize that, um, as you go, as you grow as a leader, there are certain things that you can do that you can, um, immediately control or put your hand to, to, to make a difference. And then there's a certain point where you realize where you've got to delegate and you've got to start relying on the team around you. Um, and that's been one of those hard ones. Cause as a leader, as a, you know, as a general of your team, y- you want to be there, um, for every moment of it, um, to show you're there to help them and support them. But, I've real I've really started realizing that you know they're competent and capable. They're a good team. Um, I, I want to get to a point where they can run it when I'm not there, mm-hmm. and you know that really then helps step away to be able to have that work life balance and show the rest of the team that they need to be able to do the same. And if I can exhibit the work-life balance and show them that I can have that, mm-hmm. then it's a behavior that then they can mirror and do the same in their lives. Cause I want them to be refreshed and coming in with at their best um, when they can, you know, are at the best to generate ideas, to, to be thinking um, w- bigger picture, next step, strategic. Um, I want to be, I want them to be able to do that um, and so they've got to have that balance too. And, and again, okay, it's, it's time to work guys. We got to get in. I need everybody here. Let's make it happen. But at the same time, okay, it's time to rest. It's running good. Let's step back, go home, be with your family. And so that it's hard cause it's not necessarily something that's consistent. Mm-hmm. Um, it can be changing. Uh, but really you've got to, you've got to be intentional to demonstrate that as a leader Mm -hmm. to say, Hey, I care about myself. I care about my family. I want y'all to do the same. Look good. Look at how I, I, I'm showing that, showing that and demonstrating it. Good. And and, and I think, you know, for, for high level leaders, I think sometimes when when you're talking about seasons, I think there should be seasons during the year, (laughs) Not seasons like, okay, it's been 10 years, now I need to take a break. Right, right, right. You know, but if we're not careful, we don't recognize, you know, it's been a 12-month season, and then we're about to start another 12-month season. It's like, you know, because I think when we're tired, we're not creative. Oh, absolutely. And when the leader's not creative, the company's not growing. Oh, yeah. You know, and I don't know if it's pride, you know, like you know, I have to be there or I I don't know what gets us as high level leaders, you know, but I know for me this last week, I was sick all week Mm -hmm. and they did it without me. And and I don't know if it's also an insecurity of they did it without me and it went great. Oh, sure. Sure. Absolutely. They they did it without me and I was unnecessary last week. Absolutely. Some people worry about that because if they aren't bringing the value if they aren't there, if they if they aren't in the seat, that's right. Then, uh oh, uh, then that means they don't need me. Well, uh, and Jason did JCT meeting for me, 
And all I heard was how good he did, <laughs> right? All I heard was how good graduate. <laughs> oh man, graduation was awesome. But come on, you know, and, yeah. and obviously translate that to to where you're at or where, where any other leaders are at. Oh yeah, and you know, it, 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 that's the fear. But I, you know, I, I I see it as um, as a coach, um, you're on the sideline and you're not pl- you're not playing in the game Good. and that's something i've had to realize as a leader as a as a supervisor as a as a manager um i you know i'm i'm a coach on the coach i'm a coach on the sideline yes i'm part of the team sure but i've got a specific role and if i'm always trying to get out on the court to do it um then they're not going to be able to develop like they're supposed to hmm. um and i think the other big piece um that people struggle with is this idea of perfection I think a lot of leaders get sucked into having to do it their way when they're around all the time so that um, they feel like they have that control to drive to perfection um, and aren't willing to step away and let the team fail. Hmm. And, you know, that's where um, people really grow is when they fail. It's so true. When when they don't um, meet an expectation when they don't deliver on a result, those are their opportunities um, to truly um, um, to grow and to learn from, to say, uh, uh, yeah, I realize that I didn't cut it, so what do I got to do differently next time? Hmm. And so you've got to be able to step back. And I, I talk about the, the analogy of a boat. You want people to fail above the water line and not below the water line. Very good. Um, to where <laughs> um, if, I'm, if I'm drilling a hole... Um, and I'm making a failure. I don't want it to be below the water line. So you've got to be there That's right. to support people to so that they're not failing That's catastroph- right. catastrophically, um, completely ruining a career or ruining, you know, making a s- substantial bad decision for their whole entire life. Okay, I'm Good. not going to let you do that. Right. Um, but I'm going to let you fail a little bit, and you got to learn from it. Yeah. And, I- and we too many times we don't let them do that as leaders. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I let Jason speak at graduation. I didn't let him set the budget. Right. <laughs> you right. know, so it's, it's not right. that he would fail at that, but I'm just saying. Right. You know, that's it, yeah. really really smart. Yeah. Can you think, Brooks, of any funny stories at camp? You remember, you know, you, you just talked about that one where uh, Stephen had that, you know, such a fun moment of encouraging to meet 50 people as an introvert. He, he might as well have told you to swim seven miles without training. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what are some can, – can you remember other moments? I, I, I know you, you played it safe a lot, and so uh, you, you didn't have quite the Tim Barton or the Brandon Perry moments uh, maybe um, that some of the other people would have had. But. Um, some, of, some of my failures uh, that I think back to and just think, like, for me, it was like the world was, was coming to an end. Like, I was going to get fired that week. Um, one of them was <laughs> – uh, so I was big time into Big Lake. Lo- yes, yes. Loved Big Lake. Yes. Um, loved all the different boats and sailing and knots and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Loved it. Um, and one one um, activity that I had was just one of those activities, like a bunch of good kids, but like they just kind of wanted to do their own thing. Mm, fun. And <laughs> And we all had those, but we like this one. We had we were having a blast. We had you know a million different things going on, and I you know as it, big lake, it's a big activity, right? Because it's stretching across the whole lake, different boats going different speeds, different all different directions, all at the same time, um, and you don't have much of any control over anything right. that's going on out there. And did you have the sailboats too? Sailboats going. Oh, those were terrible. Oh, they were a blast. I loved them. Yeah, I, but you would end up on the other <laughs> side of the lake. Yeah, and they didn't know how to drive. You'd end up on the... <laughs> so, like, I, this one class was a bit like that. Generally, okay, you got your whistle, and you're getting everybody directed, hey, come in, you know, turn that around, don't go too far past the buoys, whatever. And, um, man, this one class just, you know, they just... They weren't real experienced with running the different boats that were out there. And again, I d- I'm going to self-reflect. It's probably some of my leadership, but they were, they were all over the place. And like, it was time to come in. And for Big Lake, you you can see the wagon over at Go Karts leaving, and they're coming to pick you up. And at that point, like, we should be on the on the bank. Like everybody's stuff is up, and we're jumping on and going, because we got to keep to the schedule. But uh, man, this day was like. It was just one thing after another. I had I had a sailboat on the other side of the lake and couldn't t- turn around, and I've got canoes tumped over, like sinking, 
And then, um, I, like, finally, I'm, I got my JC working, and they're helping me get in, most of everybody. Um, and we finally we have one more motorboat. It was the old, small motorboats that we had out there. It wasn't like a big one. It was a miniature one with a small engine on the back of it. And they're turning, and they're coming um, to come in. And here comes the here comes the uh, wagon. I know it's coming, so we're, we're time's ticking. And I, I look at the boat, and like it looks like it's leaning a little bit more than usual. And I thought, man, that's odd. And they 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 make the turn, and I could just start to see the back end keep going down and going down. And <laughs> they stand up and start waving their hands, and they're like, "We're sinking." <laughs> <laughs> and so, so all of a sudden, like within like a couple seconds, the the top of the boat is no. just like just above the water. So I like get in the canoe and get out there, and I get out there in the middle and like pull the kids in. They're fine, but pull the kids in. Here comes the wagon, and it all the whole wagon sitting there like watching me, like, and this boat just keeps sinking and sinking and sinking, and I'm like. I don't like, and I, at that point, like I didn't have it. I was trying to pull it up, lift it up, couldn't do anything. And it was gone at that point, like never to be seen again. Gone. Gone. It's at the bottom of Big Lake. I think it's at the bottom of Big Lake still. (laughs) (laughs) I felt so bad. And this was a motorboat. Oh, yeah. This oh. was one of the small motorboats. Uh-huh, with an engine and, you yeah. know, oh, $2,000 yeah. or $3,000. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I felt terrible. <laughs> I thought I was going to get fired. <laughs> and Jeez. it was like, we were like, we were probably 30 or 45 minutes late okay. on the wagon coming up. And Steven's like standing out there like, awesome. What happened? <laughs> Well, Barton and I did scuba over there, but we never you could. Never find, found no, it. No, never oh, could. We like we would we would walk the bottom too. Uh-huh. Scuba, you know, and, it, and it's got to be out. I it's could, somewhere. I could probably tell you the general area okay. that it's in, but <laughs> I don't, we could never find it. Like we kept diving, and at a certain point, like it was too deep, we couldn't get yeah. to the bottom anymore. Yeah, that's awesome. Oh yeah, smart. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> should have I should have done things a little bit differently with that activity. <laughs> Anything else any other moments you that Steve really challenged you that you can remember of? Um Tim Barton he probably tried to challenge you and probably <laughs> teach you and coach you. Sure. That's how he rolled. Y'all had such oh, yeah. a squad, man. Oh yeah, we had a great group of friends. I know some of them have talked about it before, but man, you you build some long-lasting relationships here with the counselors. Just um kingdom building is how i describe it it's Hmm. just uh, you know kingdom building relationships that are different than any other friendships that are out there and you know the the crew any of those guys um from those couple years that i was here um any one of them i could go up and it's like we've never been gone from each other it's Hmm. just jump right back into it and connect and you know whether you know tim and mitchell and you know even you know, Kyle lived down the street from us. I know you've had him on here recently yep. and um, him and his family and just just uh, from all over. And it, it's pretty cool to be able to come back to those relationships and just reconnect all the time, especially as our kids are getting older and they're all growing up together now and going through camp together and Absolutely. starting to build those same relationships is, is pretty dang awesome. You know, I think one of the greatest things for, for leaders, you know, there's two types of friendships. There are friendships that are in your circle, right? The ones who are in the, the ring with you mm-hmm. and, and y'all are fighting together alongside each other, you know, raising kids, whatever, maybe in your yeah. church, yeah. your community, you may work with them, blah, blah, blah. They're very important because you're fighting together but but i think there's also there's an important type of friendships that's outside of the ring right they're not oh, they're yeah. not in your ring but they're in your corner sure right sure. and and they're yelling for you they're encouraging you and you need those people because i think they're a little more unbiased mm-hmm. because what happens in the ring doesn't affect their lives right and i think it's important that you have those kind of people that are in your corner, um, you know, I, I know that y'all, y'all get together some, you know, with Barton yeah. and, and, and Mitchell and different things. And I think y'all, you can have these conversations that really build 
you know, each other up. And I think high level leaders, if they're not careful, they can get isolated. Oh, sure. And, you know, because, because you're being bombarded with problems all the time. Oh, problems, yeah. problems, problems, problems. They make their way up. That's, that's oh, where they no go. Doubt. No doubt. And, and you hear the most, you know, whereas maybe your regional managers or people in different areas, they only hear the problems in their area, but you, you get all of them yep. from everyone and it can get discouraging, you know, and so maybe you're overworking, right? So you're always working. You don't have that healthy work-life balance. Then you throw in being isolated. And then you get into some of that stuff where, man, we, man, we, had, a, we had a guy recently who just, like, literally took his own life. Mm. High, you know, he was yeah. the owner of a company, but yeah. he just, it had gotten too much. <clears throat> you know, and I just think it's yeah. so important to have, for our mental health, yeah. to have those leaders that you can take a time out from what you're in. Yeah, sure. And just connect. You know, I, I know even when you and Lindsay have come in town, you and I have gotten, just talked about leadership. You know, you, right. when you and I get together, we talk about leadership, oh, yeah. leadership, leadership. What are you going? Right. What are you doing? What are you, you know, and I think that's refreshing to talk to other people who are going through the same struggles and stress you are, you know. Yeah. Um, it, you know, what, what do you think about, you know, how, how, what kind of value can you put on those kind of friendships? Oh, I, absolutely. I, I think people, um, again, going back to those leaders um, that maybe have a bit of pride to them to where they feel like they have to do it all on their own. Hmm. Like they, they have to, if I do it, if I can't do it on my own, then I'm not that good of a leader. And that's completely the opposite of the case. Hmm. Um, you know, you, you've got to have that support. You've got to have um, those people that are around you that can challenge you. Um, we talk about people that are just yes people that, you know, will just give you a yes, whatever, whatever you want to do. Yes. Okay. If you say it, you're the boss. Yes. And while I understand there's a level of respect there that, that you want people to respect you, you've got to have, you got to surround your people yourself with people that will challenge you, um, inside the ring, like you're talking about. And then outside of the ring from a, from a, um, personal level standpoint, um, from a, somebody that can challenge me, not just, uh, from a career or work standpoint, but from a, from a family standpoint, um, having those, uh, mentors in your life that can speak into you. And I, I've, you know, we, we learned this at camp too. This is something that we learned where, um, at camp we are getting mentored as counselors, um, day in and day out. Um, uh, you're getting mentored. It was, um, you and Lindley and Steven and Tim and Terry and Mim and all the groups that were above us were mentoring us. And then at the same time now we're mentoring those below us. And so you've got to have the same setup in your life. Um, uh, somebody that is mentoring you and, you know, I've got career mentors that are helping me from a career standpoint, but then, um, like you said, getting together and, and being able to challenge each other and, you know, iron sharpen iron, somebody that that's there, that's, um, helping speak into your life that isn't afraid, um, to speak truth into your life. You've got to have those people that aren't just going to say, Oh yeah, you're doing great. Everything's awesome, man. Great. You're working, you know, 16 hours a day, you know, <laughs> every day of the year. Oh, great. Just keep, keep going. You're doing awesome. You, you got to be able to have people that are saying, what the heck are you doing? Like, let, it? let's think, let's think this through Brooks. Cause it, it, if you continue this direction, here's the consequences that are going to come Come on with that. And so there, there's, you know, a whole lot of health, you know, healthy um, input that you've got to have from other people that are around you. I think that's huge. But, you know, I think we live in a world that no longer wants people challenging yeah. our ideas. Yeah. You know, yeah, sure. we live in a world where we just affirm people going unhealthily mm -hmm. in the wrong direction, yeah. you know, yeah. and, 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 and it's almost like, we, you know, we don't want people challenging our thoughts. We don't want people. Well, that's dangerous. Now we're lowering yeah. the level that everybody's at, yeah. you know, and not just like, like from a moral standpoint, but, but even, you know, I mean, why is Chick-fil-A, <laughs> Brooks, why is Chick-fil-A all of a sudden the greatest institution in our society is the, is the little chicken place down the road, right? <laughs> well, mm -hmm. you know, it's because 
they still challenge their people and and yeah. just nobody anymore wants to challenge their teams yeah. and you're just seeing as a society all of our institutions just lowering their standards yeah, right sure. Sure. i mean they 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 just you just don't see the same just pushing and challenging of people because you're scared yeah you know, and I'm sure as a leader, yeah. you have to think about that. Oh, if oh, I yeah. say something, I'm going to get sued, or oh, if they're going to get mad at me, oh, or sure. whatever. But then, when we don't have high-level leaders challenging people, I mean, you know, I mean, could you imagine if you walked up to somebody on your team and said, get all the way over there, you'll meet 50 people, you know what I'm saying? You have a lawsuit on your hands, yeah, right, right, you know? Right, yeah, and I, I, I think I think you hit on it. I think it's I think it's fear. I think we operate a lot as leaders out of fear of what could go wrong versus here's here's the strategy, here's the truth, here is the why we're doing what we're doing, and we're going to continue down this path. I think the other piece of it is pride that goes mm. back to this idea of you can't admit you're wrong. Mm. You know, this idea of not wanting people to speak into you or challenge you, and, it you know, it's it's founded in pride to where – People, you know, want, you know, their universe revolves around them. And hmm. if somebody else is um, coming in and saying that's not right, then your world is going to start to crumble when it's when it's built on you. It's like building your house on the sand. It's going to crumble hmm. versus being built on truth, being being built on the rock. Um, it's good. And um, so so leaders, again, if they have pride that's going to keep them. That's going to hold you back from being able to allow people, whether it's um, outside your group, you know, above you, your boss or whatever, or even people within your group that work for you Mm -hmm. um, that can speak into your life to say, Hey, Hey Brooks, uh, this decision that you made, um, I, I don't necessarily know if I agree or here's, here's where I'm seeing it. And again, it's a, okay, let's have a conversation about it. I don't have enough pride that I'm not willing to sit at the table and say, well, let's talk about it. Let's figure it out. And I, I love want, that. I want you to hear from my perspective, what I see. And I want to hear from your perspective of what you see. Um, and I, by no means do I have all the answers. And I think leaders fail all the time when they think they've got to have all the answers. Wow. That's so good. It's the same thing with our, with our marriage too. If we come into the marriage and I, you know, I'm coming from an approach where I have to always be right, or I always have to come up with the answer. We're going to fail. My wife has way better ideas than me all the time and is thinking about things way differently than I think about it. And most of the time she's right. And I'm, I'm good with that. I admit, I admit that, but you know, it's us coming as a team and figuring out what's the right decision here. What's the best thing for us as a family, as a team. And you know, that's going to lead to more success than me just because I'm the boss. I have to come up with the right answer. No, I agree with that 100%. I mean, (laughs) Melissa is the, she's the better parent for sure. (laughs) She's definitely the better one in the relationship. And then, you know, for you guys, I mean, y'all would y'all wouldn't have the limited. You would always have less than the <laughs> way, way you know, less. you know, she's like, No, we're going for the limited <laughs> edition of that of that of that vehicle. But uh <laughs> we we will have to talk about that story, Lindsay, when you're on. Uh, but uh no, it, it's so true. Let me ask you this. Have you ever apologized to any team members? Have you ever, as a leader, been that vulnerable? Because I, I've had people say, I, I don't know if I could apologize to my team. I don't, I don't know if I could do that because the, the fear, it, it, I think it goes back to fear, pride and fear. But the fear is they won't respect me mm-hmm. if I admit that I'm wrong. And I think the deception is it's the opposite that happens. Oh, absolutely. People want to... People wanna want to work for somebody that is authentic that's genuine that knows that they care about them that knows that they'll listen to them that knows that they have the best interest out for you as a as an employee um you know i I talk about um a lot of times of being uh, a leader very much like david king david was in the bible to where um he had people that worked for him that respected him enough that um, he was in the midst of battle and the, you know, behind enemy lines and um, just was daydreaming about a drink from the well of Bethlehem. And his guys heard this, overheard it, made their way through enemy lines, um, snuck through and brought him back water um, just because, you know, he said it. And, and for me, 
that's the kind of leader I want to be is, mm. is where people um, work around me that have, you know, respect me enough that would do just about anything for me. Um, and you're only going to get that from people that know that you care about them. That's it. And so um, it's not easy. Uh, it's not easy to say, hey, I'm wrong. I messed up. Uh, but but people would prefer to hear that than somebody that's going to just keep pressing forward and keep pushing to say um, that this was my decision and, you know, I'm stick- I'm not changing my mind. Um, pe- people want to hear, hey, it's not about being perfect. It's, it's just about, you know, progressing each and every day. That's so good. No, authenticity. I oh, think yeah. – Everybody wants people who are real, yeah. which which to be real, they know you're flawed. I mean, they mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? And I think people are starving for that. And I think here at camp, yeah. what they loved was they saw these college, these high school and college age students who were just genuine. Mm-hmm. They were just real, yeah. you know, and I think in the back of their mind, they were wondering, are they fake? Are they, you know, are, are they whatever? And we were like, no, no. I mean, these these guys are real. Oh, that, yeah. I mean, they genuinely are living mm-hmm. to the best of their ability what they're talking to you about. And I think that's what just it blew people away and still yeah. does today. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Because you have you have kids that come in from all different walks of life and you can pick out the ones that, you know, have a lot going on that have a lot of things in the background that are challenging um, that they're really looking for somebody to care, that somebody that is authentic mm. um, with them. And so you can, even the short duration of, you know, one week session, um, how much you can build um, with a kid by by being authentic with them and, and showing them that you care about them, showing them that you love them. Um, you know, a representation of the love of Christ mm-hmm. um, that we have in us and through us um, to them. And, you know, that there's there's something there that just connects kids week in and week out, year after year after year. And that legacy is built off of that. Um, just just being able to show kids the love of Christ. And 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 then again, um, you take that as you go on in, you know, in your career, in your family, with your community. Um, you know, there, there's something enticing there that people want that isn't in the world, and, hmm. and people just want to see that. I love that. You know, as we end here, Brooks, I want to ask you one more question. You know, what, what does the legacy of Brook Hill mean to you? And then now that you're watching your kids go through that, you know, you know, and I know it's a great question I want to ask Lindsay too, but, you know, what does that mean to you, you know, to see Miles and Gav and, and Brooke, you know, what, you yeah. know, what does that mean to you? What do you see that they're getting out of, uh, out of the legacy? And do you feel like it's still the same? Oh yeah. You know, from when your dad had it to when you had it yeah. to, to now that, that your kids are experiencing it, you know, what, what does it mean to you? While, while the, you know, activities change or um, all of the, the sweet upgrades that we've got now versus <laughs> when we for had, <laughs> but then when we had them, um, while all of the surface level things can change, um, you know, there's something very special about camp that coming back Come year on. after year um, it is, it is just so, so cool that it's, it's hard to describe it really, but it's, it's this idea of, um, people can come here um, and be themselves That's it. Um, to be loved. And um, just like I received it, um, love, loving me um, in and through my imperfections, loving me um, in and, and through to my um, better self, you know, continuing to pr- improve. Um, and now being able to get to see that in my kids and it just continues on. And that was the amazing thing. Um, that I remembered as a counselor, I remembered um, people that my dad influenced um, as a as a um, as a uh, camp director, um, and they you know they came back and were bringing their kids. Come um, on, Stuart Barry Hill was yep. third grade in my in my cabin. I remember his dad talking about man. I remember when you were this tall and your dad was here. And Come this, on, and all the cool things that went on. Um, and then now. Uh, my kids are 
going through the same thing. I get to walk into a cabin and hand my kids off to a counselor and know that the same thing is going to happen. And that's, that's the amazing thing with camp is just, yes, you know, things can change, but you know, that, that foundation of loving kids, bringing kids in and changing, you know, changing their life um, with the gospel is, is the true legacy that's there. And being able to do that year after year after year, hundreds and thousands of kids that come through um, that get to uh, experience that and then take that out. I one of the other podcasts was just talking about being able to then make your Brook Hill wherever you're at, making life um, you know, the best wherever you are. And that's what we've had to do is we've moved and changed and gone all over the place. But, you know, we've, we've made, we've recreated Brook Hill wherever we're at and that's it. loving our family and loving those that are around us. That's been the biggest thing we've been echoing. Yeah. And, and that's honestly why I want to do the podcast mm-hmm. because I wanted to show, look at Brooks's Brook yeah. Hill, yeah. you know, look at Mitchell's Brook Hill. Yep. You know, look at Maley's, look at Tim Barton's, look at Steve Sexton. Yeah. Cause that's what Hetty always told us was build your own Brook Hill. Right. You know, and and as we do that, that's literally the Great Commission. Mm-hmm. That's literally what Matthew, yeah. you, know, you know, Jesus was saying at the end of Matthew yeah. is is go out. Right. You know, and it's not necessarily about Brook Hill, but it's it's just the concept of loving people, loving Jesus and having a great time mm-hmm. where you're at. Yeah. And so, man, I, I love that. I love the history, the legacy. Oh, yeah. I mean, your dad was here and obviously your mom. Uh, you're looking at like late 70s, early 80s, somewhere right. around there. Right. And then, you know, you were early 2000s, and yeah. now here we are in the 20s, <laughs> the yeah. 2020s, you know. And, yeah. and, 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 you know, obviously we're celebrating Hetty's birthday today, yeah, actually, today. when we're recording this, yep. 92, 92 years, years old, old, born in 1930. I mean, that's She's just going strong. amazing. Yes. In a car driving around. So. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Well, man, Brooks, I appreciate you being on love here. Love being here. You know, I, I knew way back when, when you were a graduate in my cabin, that you were going to be a high-level leader. Yeah. I knew back then. No, it, seriously, I did, because I remember that um, your graduate year, I think we had you as a ninth grader, and we had like 10 third graders, That's if you I remember. just talking to your wife about. Yeah. We, I always, we always had like yeah. all third graders with us for, yeah. for whatever reason. <laughs> I we don't got, know. Yeah. We got smoked at Olympics all the time. Yeah, I think Terry hated us or something. <laughs> but, uh, the, but but then the next year, I remember we had all the older kids once you were a red T-shirt yeah. with us. But yeah. uh, anyway, man, I appreciate you being on your Brooks, man. Yeah. I love your leadership insight. Thanks, man. And, uh, you know, you're literally doing that. You're building your own Brook Hill. Right. Man, that's so cool. Like 200 people, 100 direct people that are underneath you. I mean, yeah. that's, that's dude, that's keep cool. killing it, man. Yeah, love love it. it. Appreciate thanks, you, buddy. Thanks for being here. Yeah, love man. you, man. It's cool.